pulling us out of the pandemic, finance officials across the globe pushing all governments to spend more. The biggest threat to the global recovery, says the IMF managing director, pulling the plug on stimulus spending too soon. So what does that mean for your investments? Well, for more, we're going to go to Brett Eversole, senior analyst on True Wealth. Uh, tell us, Brett, how important is this stimulus spending to uh, consumer confidence? Yeah, I think uh, I think really the recovery we've seen over the past six months has been completely tied to the uh, the liquidity that's been put into the system by central banks around the world and the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus that's been passed here in the U.S. Um, I mean, we saw the Fed cut rates to zero. We they promised unlimited QE. They're out in the market doing things they've never done before, buying commercial paper, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, um, and I think this has really just put a bid under the market. And we're starting to see that show up in consumer confidence. Um, people are getting more out there. They're kind of starting to feel back to normal a little bit. Um, and that spending's picked up. And I think that that Fed liquidity isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. And that's really been a big driver, not only of consumer confidence, but of the, uh, the big rally we've seen in the market over the past few months. Yeah, yeah, Brett, to your point, I mean, the levels of liquidity have been amazing, both on a fiscal side, the government, and a monetary side from the Fed, like you're talking about. And the, the really interesting part to me about all of that is these guys are, are ready to do even more. And, yeah. and that's, you know, it, it's it's mind boggling. And just the, the, the way you're talking about doing trillions more in stimulus. And, it, you know, maybe there's some politics going on right now. It doesn't happen before the election, but it's coming. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, Brett, what are your feelings on, you know, how does this wind up affecting the stock market? What are the implications there? Well, like to your point, Scott, um, you know, we've seen we've seen Congress waffle a bit on the second round of, uh, of monetary stimulus here in the U.S. But Fiscal the stimulus, yeah. Politics. Um, yep. And, you know, the Fed's already put out six trillion in in new liquidity into the market. And that's um, just for reference, <laughs> Bernanke, seven years to put half that amount of liquidity into the market. So we've it's already seen yeah. in investor behavior. Um, in my view, we have seen kind of animal spirits alive in the market in the past two or three months in a way that we haven't seen really in the last 10 years. Um, and that's especially true, I think, in retail investors. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows uh, David Portnoy has kind of become the, uh, the, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of, of this trend. And I mean, he's obviously a really smart guy. He's built a business and sold a very valuable Hey, we're business. on bar stools. Do we count? There you go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, he's out there on Twitter every day saying that stocks yeah. don't go down and saying that he's better than Warren Buffett. And I think he's kind of at this point leading this this army of, uh, of Robin Hood traders that are really kind of euphoric in the market. And a lot of those folks, you know, they they're there's just a lot of gamblers in the U.S. People just like to go out and do that. And the sports shut down, especially with the yeah. lockdown. I mean, what else are they going to do? They can't bet. On, they can't go to sports events. Exactly. So so what happened is that, you know, that sports betting shut down. And all those gamblers moved into the stock market and they had two or three or four months of straight higher moves in stocks. And if they were really in the uh, the riskiest type things, they made a lot of money. So you've kind of you built this band of people who are probably pretty new to the market that are incredibly bullish and just view it as this one way ride higher and a simple way to gamble. Um, and that's something that hasn't really existed at any point during the last 10 year bull market. Yeah. Now, we, we sort of got this uh, sort of sense of where things are going economically from yeah. um, the conference that we've been covering this week at the IMF, um, a big push towards uh, spending in digital architecture and green infrastructure in particular coming out of Europe. Let me play the sound and we'll get to you on the other side. Public investment, especially in green projects and digital infrastructure, can be a game changer with the potential to create millions of new jobs, well-paying jobs, while boosting productivity, raising incomes. Supporting workers as they transition to new jobs is a key element of a more resilient and inclusive future, particularly important for those most affected today, women, young people. They are those that should benefit from a just transition. So, Brent, one of the interesting things that uh, the IMF has really been talking about as well is, is spending more on this new economy and the digital infrastructure. So technology is really going to be, be supported by all this. And we think there's going to be a lot more spending on things like you know, cloud infrastructure, semiconductors. What do you think that does for the stock market? 
Well, I think I think these are trends that have been going on, you know, for the last ten or fifteen years, um, and they're not going to stop anytime soon. Obviously, when you see politicians and uh, people like that at the IMF speaking about these things, this is not going to end anytime soon. And if anything, it's going to get the backstop of you know governments around the world. What that means is the companies in those sectors that have already been winning and have been performing really well are going to keep performing really well. You know, if you're in a lot of these, these types of technology sectors are really great businesses from the start. You know, they have incredibly high margins. Um, a lot of times they're very uh, inexpensive to operate and to grow. So you add that kind of business model and then you get kind of government backing and government interest behind it. And it's really, you can kind of, that's going to really blow up. You know, there's, nothing's going to slow that down. And I think that's going to catch a lot of people flat-footed, too, because they're, you turn on CNBC, you turn on Bloomberg, so many of these pundits that go on TV and like, oh, technology stocks can't run anymore. But yet we're seeing the economy change right in front of our eyes. And all these plays, like you just said, that have benefited from this, there's only going to be more money pouring into them because as the economy changes and expands, they're the ones that are really going to, going to benefit the most from all the spending because of what they produce that's what's needed more of. And the other thing that I think is really primed to explode is digital payments. I mean, it's already exploding in Asia, um, and Europeans are really much more ripe for the picking than Americans are to to really make use of that, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, you know, we've been writing about that trend in China specifically since about 2015. Um, we visited, uh, I visited China in 2016, and we got there, and it was the first time I'd ever been and what we noticed right away is that people just weren't paying with cash. And you go to a market and you pay for you know, your produce or whatever you're buying with WeChat on your phone. And obviously, Americans are maybe a little more resilient to that change. And there's more kind of in our ecosystem that makes it more complicated the way payment networks and credit cards and those work. Yeah. You know how ingrained those are in our society. But that trend of kind of going more towards cashless, whether it's a China type system or some kind of a hybrid system, that, that that trend is here and it's going to continue to grow. And finding companies in that space that are kind of leading the charge, are, that's going to be a good way to make a lot of money investing. You know, I, I always thought it was funny when you guys, when I first heard you guys start talking about this trend and you were talking about your visits to China and you said there were panhandlers that were asking people to pay them via WeChat. <laughs> I like, really? And yeah, be a, a, a QR code on a sign that you could. Uh, That's you unreal. Could yeah, I never saw that in China. That's crazy. It, it reminds me of when I, I lived in New York. Uh, I was walking down the streets one time, and it, I remember some guy hit me up for twenty bucks. I'm like, what? High <laughs> rollers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, you know, you guys have uh, talked about the melt up. And sort of, uh, how do you feel? A lot of these trends play right into your melt up thesis, no? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, like I said, the, the discussion we had before about kind of the retail investors and how they're getting excited, I think that's kind of the first step. Um, what's also interesting is that kind of over the past six months, the kind of institutional, the more professional money manager side has been slower and they've been more cautious, but that's starting to change over the last two or three months. Um, so in the most recent uh, Bank of America fund manager survey, it's a monthly survey of about two or 300 fund managers. So these are professional investors, and um, this most recent month that came out uh, a couple of days ago, the, they do like tail risk, like what are the biggest risks to the market. And in September, the number two tail risk was a tech bubble, and that fell to number three and almost down to number four in the October uh, survey. And also cash levels that these institutional money managers are holding fell to the lowest we've seen since the COVID stuff mm. that happened and also the, the fall we've seen over the last six months in that uh, those cash levels are those it's the fastest decline we've seen since 2003 so we have this situation where retail investors are starting to get excited for the first time and money managers are starting to get excited for the first time and they're becoming less and less worried about you know the tech bubble and that's really what has to happen for a tech bubble to exist and to take place people can't be worried about it because if they're worried about it they can't really take hold and we're starting to see, if you look at valuations of some of those big names, um, you know, Amazon's PE is up 50% this year. Um, yeah. Apple's PE is like doubled this year. But people aren't worried about a tuck bubble as much today as they were a month ago. And that's what has to happen for this to really get going and take off. So what's really interesting about that is something you and I have discussed recently is 
the amount of money that's still left in money market mutual funds uh, when the COVID crisis started. Uh, so for anybody that's listening, that, that's a very defensive place to, to put your money. And by putting your money in a money market mutual fund, you're basically earning nothing. Um, so when the COVID crisis started, $1.2 trillion went into money market mutual funds. It, it hit a new all-time record. Uh, and we've only seen about a third of that trickle back out so far, despite the rally in the stock market. So that, that means there's you know, at least $800 billion of money still left to be put to work. And they're going to see that stocks are the best place to get returns right now. And, and I, I would think, Brad, a lot of that money is going to flow back into the stock market. No? Yeah, I think, I think so, definitely, Scott. And uh, what's interesting there is it could be even more than that. Like you say, $1.2 trillion ended up going into those uh, there's money market funds, but I think the total today is around four trillion. And generally, yeah. that that measure has an upward trajectory. But I think if we really get into that, into this melt up scenario as it continues to play out, I think not only could that one point two trillion come out, but even more could come out and pour into the market because we're in this situation where there's nowhere else to make money. You can't buy bonds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to precious metals, you can go to things like that, but those are still relatively fringy investments for you know, the typical mom and pop type investor. It's really stocks or bonds, and who wants to buy treasuries at 0.7%? Right. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. So you're writing about the melt up uh, for this upcoming issue, is that right? Yeah, we've been writing about it a lot in, uh, in True Wealth, our, our paid service. Um, and this is, I mean, this is a trend we've been talking about for a long time, but I think really right now is. Everything is kind of coming to a head right now. So we've been covering that in True Wealth and finding ways to take advantage of that and to, uh, to profit from these big trends. All right, Brett Eversole there from True Wealth. We thank you for your time and analysis. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you want to be connected to his writing, just click on your screen. We'll give you a link. And of course, you can always find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. That's all for now.